Uh, Miss, you have 45 minutes for your presentation, that uh, uh, including questions and answer sessions. Now the state is yours. Namaskaram, Prakun Sao. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to say I feel very thankful that uh, SSBU invited me to be here. I feel really honored to present um, about Ajansha, the forest tradition of Ajansha and the Western monasteries in his lineage here. The topic is quite long, actually. It was from my dissertation eight years ago. The full title is The Western Monasteries Linked to the Thai Forest Tradition in the Lineage of Ajahn Chah, The Division Between the Original Buddhism and the Thai Tradition. And before I introduce you to Ajahn Shah, I have to inform you some terms that I am going to use in the presentation. First, the Western monasteries. Usually when I say Western monasteries, I refer to um, only uh, monasteries that are related to Ajahn Shah lineage. And many people usually think about um, monasteries in the West, uh, like in Europe, like in the UK or Switzerland or in Italy. But actually, it also includes other countries like um, Canada, the States, uh, New Zealand, and Australia as well. Just an example. And it should be noted that Thai people usually refer to the monks by title in front of their name. Um, and people often call the monks Ajan, Ajan. Ajan is like Saya, it means the master or the teacher. And sometimes we refer to the monk Long Pa, Long Ta. Uh, Long Pu Cha, Pa means father. So when we say Long Pa, we usually refer to the monks who, whose age are similar to our father. And when we say Long Ta, Long Pu, we refer to the monks whose age are similar to our grandfather. And it gives some intimacy in the titles. So let's start with the biography of Ajahn Shah. Ajahn Shah was born in the northeastern part of Thailand. This part of the country, um, many people in Thailand have prejudice that this part is financially poor, um, but actually spiritually very rich. Um, many great meditation master comes from this part of the country. And Ajahn Shah was born here in Ubon Rajatani. You can see the red part here on the map. And when he was a boy, he ordained as a novice first. And he studied some um, Buddhist teachings. But when he was 20 years old, he fully ordained. If, if we look at the biography of Ajahn Shah in Wat Nong Pa Phong Resorts, uh, they say Ajahn Shah uh, felt uh, he wanted to develop um, his uh, understanding in the Dharma. But if you look in other source, um, many people mention, oh, you know, Ajahn Shah um, had this experience of heartbroken before he ordained, before Upasampata. But whatever reason, um, 
I don't know the fact, I just read many sources just to cross check, but for whatever reason my focus was on his style of practice that emphasized on the strict uh, monastic code that shape the life and meditation practice in the monastery and the unite or the conformity of the Vinaya in his monastery and branch monasteries in the West as well. And I would like to add some information about ordination in Thailand. Like he said, uh, Dr. Dr. Shuti Shuti Pat said uh, many people ordain in Thailand for their parents because we felt parents had sacrificed a lot for us and one way especially for males to pay back to pay something back to their parents is to ordain and parents in Thailand usually they feel they can gain merits or boon when their sons ordain and right now many females ordain as well and some additional point about ordination in thailand um, it's also a way to access to the education because across the country there are different opportunities in accessing good education uh, so particularly in the countryside, people encourage their kids to ordain in order to access good education in the monasteries. Let's go back to the biography of Ajahn Shah. His first few years of his ordination, he learned the Pali language and the Pali text, which is very, very important in the Theravada country because we believe that uh, the teaching can be traced back to the Mahakasapa time and the 500 Arahan that recite uh, the Tama and Vinaya together. And those Arahan uh, saw the Buddha himself so the Theravada tradition really uh, placed importance on study the Pali language. And as Shah, his first few years, he studied the Pali language and with basic Buddhist teaching. It's quite a Pariyati aspect, which is more academic aspect of the practice. But as Shah had the turning point when his father died, he reflected on that and he thought he knew some Pali and knew some basic teaching, but didn't seem to go nearer to the real essence of the Buddhist teaching. So finally, Ajahn Shah decided to leave and leave the studies, leave the academic studies and went on the pilgrimage. And he walked 400 kilometers to the central Thailand. And he only simply lived on the alms food that lay people gave him along the way. And he wandered through the forest where he could encounter tigers, cobras, and he could gradually develop his practice on that environment as well, because that kind of environment strengthened his practice. And he took up the residence where he carefully uh, studied the monastic code. And he heard about Ajahn Man Puritato, who was the greatest meditation master during that time. And Ajahn Shah wanted to meet Ajahn Man so much that he walked back to the northeastern part of Thailand. And finally, Ajahn Shah met Ajahn Man. And he spent a short period, but very enlightening period of time with him. And after that, for around seven years, 
Ajahn Shah wander, usually wander alone through the forest scene. Uh, he practiced on the cremation ground or in the forest or in the cave. And finally, he was asked to settle in the grove forest very close to the village he was born. And gradually, uh, lay people and monastic start to gather around him. And Wat Nong Pa Pong was fin finally established. What means the temple? So Pa Pong Temple was established. And after that, for around a decade, there was a young American man who later became Ajahn Sumeto, came to see Ajahn Shah and asked him if he could practice with Ajahn Shah. During that time, Ajahn Sumeto uh, ordained and practiced meditation by himself for a year in the Laotian border. And he met Prathamathut, uh, whose name is Pra Samai. And he he talked with this Prathamatut and and he was encouraged to see Azan Shah. And Azan Sumato thought, yes, maybe I need some teacher who can teach me the aspect of the monastic life. So he finally see each other, um, see Azan Shah. And Ajahn Shah accepted Ajahn Sumato as his disciple, but he said, no excuse of being the Westerner. You need to conform to the life here. Uh, live the simple life like, like others. Live on the alms food like others. Ajahn Sumato usually reflected on that, that many times he needed to do things that he didn't really want to do. And he started to complain in his mind, oh, what these people do was kind of stupid. I don't want to be in this monastery anymore. I'm angry with Ajahn Shah so much. It's in his mind. But he finally, Ajahn Sumato, uh, can take this as the meditation practice because when he was angry toward something, he can be aware and develop the mindfulness uh, concerning the emotions arising in his mind, or even when he had to sit at the meditation hall for a long time, he can observe uh, his physical sufferings as well. And Ajahn Sumato really trusts Ajahn Shah he said that he believed many times Ajahn Shah done something purposely for him and other students to develop the patience, develop the endurance, and not attach to the tranquility or the peacefulness and surrender to the way things are. And when Ajahn Sumaito was five years in his ordination, there are more and more Westerners who are interested in practicing the Dharma. So Ajahn Shah appointed Ajahn Sumaito to teach them as well. And finally, the International Forest Monastery has been established, and Ajahn Sumaito became the abbot of this monastery. And this monastery has the purpose of teaching English-speaking Westerners in the forest monastic code and Theravada Buddhism in the forest tradition of Ajahn Shah. You see there are a lot of Western students who follow the Ajahn Shah tradition and they learned in this International Forest Monastery. What Ajahn Sumaito really impressed with Ajahn Shah is the style of Ajahn Shah that 
emphasize the strict Vinaya and the conformity or the community of the monastics and the way it could shape the Dharma practice. Now you know that the International Forest Monastery has been established. After that, there are more and more Western students. And Ajahn Sumeto and Ajahn Shah in 1977 has been invited by the English Sankha Trust to the UK, to the United Kingdom. And two years later, the Shitawiwek or Shithurst Buddhist Monastery has been formed. And apart from that, uh, many of Ajahn Shah's disciples are competent enough to go across the world to spread the Dharma. So you will see a lot of branch Western monastery in Ajahn Shah tradition across the world. For example, Amaravati in the UK, Dhammapala in Switzerland, uh, Santa Shitaram in Italy, and many other monasteries. And these monasteries have the Western students of Ajahn Shah as the abbot in charge of the monastery. This monastery gained a lot of attention of multicultural follower, such as European, Thai, American, Europeans, Sri Lankan as well. And Western monastics in these monasteries, they use the tra traditional method spreading the Dharma, and they also use new technologies like podcast, website, Facebook page to spread the Dharma. And they adapt differently to the needs of the new context. And lay people in Thailand also go to this Western monastery a lot. Like lay people, um, Thai lay people who live in the West also go to give the material requisites or the funds for the monastery. And therefore, the Western abbots can highly appreciate it, the kindness of Thai Buddhists. And these Western monastery have a very good connection with Thai monks in Wat Nong Ba Pong. Twice a year, Western senior monks we sit Wat Nong Pa Pong in the commemoration of Ajahn Shah and a lot of senior monks in Wat Nong Pa Pong also visit these Western monasteries. And look at this from this perspective. The Western monasteries in Ajahn Shah's tradition has been well adapted to the new context. And in the meantime, they also keep a very good connection with Thai, Thai people. However, now I will introduce you to another group of people. Their disagreement arisen from the Western Junior Monastics. These junior or the younger generation of monks usually ordained by Ajahn Sumeto and have almost no connection with Thai culture. And the Western Junior Monastic, I would call them the second group, mainly disagree with the Western abbots. Why, why they disagree? Which aspect? They disagree with the supreme authority in decision making. Because normally in Thailand, um, the abbots are the master and are in charge of the monastery. And usually people will follow the decision of the abbot, whether they like it or not. And this is seen as a part of the mind training program, 
like Ajahn Shah did to Ajahn Sumedho. Uh, Ajahn Sumedho usually reflect on this sometimes. He said, oh, you know, um, in the initial state, he didn't know Thai language that much. And Ajahn Shah even speak Laos, even speak Isan dialects. And sometimes he say, oh, you st started to give the Dharma talk in Isan. Can I go back to my Kuti in the hut and meditate alone? And Ajahn Shah, no, you have to stay here. Um, be patient. So this is seen as a part of letting go of one preference. And Ajahn Sumedho finally take it as the meditation practice. So he had no problem with that. He felt a lot of compassion from Ajahn Shah. But these Western junior monastics now, they are quite different. They stay with the Western abbots together, and, but they grew up in the environment that encouraged the consultation in the community. They want to vote, you know, in, in our generation, we have to vote. We disagree with this and that, we have to rebel. <laughs> so these uh, monks want to participate in the process of decision making. And they claim that uh, Western senior Albots usually have private meetings or decide things that affect their life without consulting them. And they also claim that they want to be able to criticize the seniors without suppress the feelings. And it is very similar to the Western psychology that many of them have studied and accepted. They claim that when they criticize uh, people who are senior, like superior to them, uh, this behavior it has been interpreted as the dis disrespectful behavior. And I quite understand that. They say some Western and Thai senior monks say this is disrespectful. Um, in Thai culture, we have the different ranks of people and you relate to them differently. Uh, and we have this kind of hierarchical structure, like parents are superior to the children, the king is superior to the lay people, the monks are superior to the lay people, and more or less, sometimes in some rural context, the males are superior to the females. And we are taught that if we relate to the people who are superior to us, we can't really criticize them. We can think about it, but cannot say that much. So I quite understand why uh, this behavior has been interpreted that like that. One of my informant expressed the disagreement that oh, Buddhist organization as we find it in the Vinaya or the monastic code is democracy. It sounds like democracy, but it's not democracy, it's democracy. And in the context, he means the system that is governed by the Dharma not the particular group of people. And he continues saying, Western abbots hold on to the Thai hierarchical system, which is not in line with the Vinaya. The abbots don't study the Pali text analytically. So in this situation, the second group authorize the centralized power of the abbots and they select some part of the Pali text like Kopakamoklana Sutra or 
they select other documents as well. Even the Kalama, uh, Kalama Sutra has been selected, and they read some parts of the Tipitaka and interpret, uh, conclude that the original Buddhism is democracy, which they expect that will be less hierarchical and they will have more spaces to express themselves. When I did the research, I didn't pay much attention to the details, but I focused on the structure. And the structure is they use the texts to negotiate with the power of the seniors. And they separate the original Buddhism from the Thai tradition. I agree with them, only some parts, that Thai culture can keep maintaining the hierarchy in the Western monasteries. But also you can argue to what extent uh, the hierarchy comes from Thai tradition, because you can argue no religion is practiced in its pure form. It's always a matter of time and place and their conclusions of the original Buddhism based on the Tipitaka might not be absolute either. So the question is who is using the text for which purpose? And in this situation, they use the text to uh, decentralize the power of the seniors. But I, I don't think that the abbots will simply decentralize the power uh, just according to the interpretation of the original Buddhism. And I have update information a bit before I come here. Uh, some of the senior abbots retire from being abbot already because this is based on my research eight years ago. So the dynamic has changed. And because these Western abbots ordained for more than 40 years ago, so right now they are quite old. And these Western junior monks become the Terra themselves. So they have the different perspective. So they can see how things in the monastery operate on the higher level which now they are in, in the higher level. And I have discovered something, subtleties, behind the reaction of the second group here. And I think it's in, interesting to share. Usually when these lower rank monks interpret the original Buddhism, they say a lot about equality or humanistic approach or rationalistic approach. This is because based on my interview with them, um, many of them was disappointed with the context before, with the centralized power in their home country before. For example, they disappointed with the power of Christian institution in their countries. They disagree with the communism in their country. They disagree with the government that sent people to die in the war. And therefore, when they read about Buddhism, especially the Theravada, they can mix some expectation to conclude that Theravada should be better than where they come from. Like they, they may find something better outside of their context. So it is very understandable that when they come to, when they ordain in the Western ministry and they encounter uh, authority or the Thai politics in the Western ministry, they can feel very uncomfortable. 
I can relate to that <laughs> as well. When we, when we were young, uh, we can disagree with many authority higher than us, like uh, this teacher in the school, like five o krong, or our parents order us to do this and not to do that, or the boss in the institutions. But if we get old, we can have the higher rank and we can encounter younger people who rebel against us as well. So I think it's kind of unavoidable situation. Except you are the tra traveler or the guest outside of the system, you can uh, escape from that hierarchical or authority like that. But in my perspective, uh, if you live in some system, you always meet the authority over you. Okay, come back to the character of this monk. This monk uh, decided to ordain and they need a strong or rebellious character in order to do so because normally the mainstream is the Christian Christianity or Catholic Protestant or atheism even. When they decide to ordain, they are quite anomalous, like alienated, different from their mainstream culture. I used to talk with some female monastic and one of them said, oh, you know, when I ordain, my mother said, oh, I will be pleased if you are a prostitute than wanting to be the pikuni, something like that. Because you, you know it's kind of the decision that the mainstream maybe disagree to you, so you need to have some rebellious or strong character. And when people who have the rebellious character have to stay under the control of other people, they can feel uncomfortable. It's very understandable. And last thing, these people, the second group of people, use the textual interpretation a lot in the negotiation because the polytext can be regarded as a source of authority. In conclusion, their disagreement of the authority of the Western abbots in the monasteries linked to the Thai forest tradition of Ajahn Shah and the monastic who have lower ranks use the texts and interpret about the original Buddhism and they use this to negotiate with the authority and they separate the original Buddhism from the Thai tradition. And you can see that the interpretation can be toned by the expectations or the ideals as well. Before I come here, I talked to one monk and he visited Azan Sumato. And there are still uh, this kind of problems going on in the Western monasteries, like in the UK. Many junior monks can rebel against the Vinaya conformity. Uh, they don't want to conform to the monastic code, especially those who have the Ameri American background can rebel a lot. But as An Sumato said, uh, now Buddhism has different flavors in the Western countries. And many people can select uh, the meditation course, psychological and meditation um, combined together or whatever. Uh, they can go to tests, but 
if they go to see Ajahn Sumato, he said he could only offer this kind of uh, Ajahn Shah tradition, which focus on the monastic code that can shape the Dharma practice. Questions. If anyone have any questions, please proceed to uh, proceed to ask it and make it short. Any questions? <coughs> Thank you, Nampa, for very interesting. Although your your work is uh, eight years old, I think it's uh, as uh, relevant as uh, it was before. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure in your original if you did touch on any controversy you know, about the bikuni. And um, once again, okay, in the UK, it has, uh, has, it has come to um, the forefront because um, uh, Ajahn Pram has has decided to to to, to set up the uh, Anukam Anuk, Anukamba project uh, to to set up a big news in Nanri in the UK. I have not heard any reaction, you know, from the Amravati or from the uh, Wat Pasantitam. Uh, so I don't know if you have any update on this. Uh, I don't have any update about this. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare asking this question over there because I know all of them. <laughs> I feel uncomfortable asking this question. I, I just observe it, okay, so silently, and and I have, uh, as, as I said, you know, contact with all of them. Uh, I'm Akasena Langtai. Thank you very much for your presentation. I've learned a lot from your presentation. Uh, my question: I just want to know. Uh, as you know, the priest, the Kalan abbot is Ajahn Amaro. Yeah. I just want to know, when you did your research, is it belong to the first group or the second group? <laughs> <laughs> According to the ethics, <laughs> I have to protect their identities. Even in my research, I have to use the code like DMW45, you know, um, like use the letter uh, instead of their name. Sorry about that. Any more questions? Okay, first of all, I would like to thank you a lot. I I used to frequent the uh, uh, Amravati monastery, but I didn't know of these updates and 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 I didn't know of the of the situation in the monasteries through these angles. That is very interesting to me. Uh, my question is about the, your conclusion. You said that um, some monastics now are rebelling. Okay, mostly on the base of um, they, they they are using the polytext to negotiate. But you also said that now some are also rebelling against the Vinaya itself. Not, um, not against the Vinaya. They don't want to conform to the monastic code. Uh, the monastic yes. code is in the Vinaya. Mm -hmm. Yes. So w w Wait, do we talk what, 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 about what, the same thing? Sorry. Yeah. What do you use? Mm -hmm. to, what do you use to 
as an excuse to protest against the monastic code if the monastic code is written in the Pali text? No, no. The what I heard uh, the update information before I come here is they they disagree with the Vinaya conformity. Mm -hmm. And on the base of what? But I don't know on the base of ah, what. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, because it's a contradiction. If yes. they use Pali text, mm -hmm. how, now, now they are also mm -hmm. protesting against mm -hmm. Pali text. Against itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We will take one more question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, very interesting and informative uh, presentation. Um, I would like to know how you got impressed or enchanted by this Ajahn Chah tradition. As for me, I have one word uh, that impressed uh, Ajahn Chah a lot. That is, Ajahn Chah has taught that um, if you have time to breathe, you have time to meditate. So that was the teaching I have noted. And in your case, which make you impressed uh, to make research on this, particularly on this Ajahn Chah's tradition, and, and any um, special uh, features or significance uh, that, that make you do this research and um, some notable teachings if you would like to express from Ajahn Chah's teaching. Thank you very much. Mm, Ajahn Chah's teaching is uh, very simple. He didn't use the, that kind of sophisticated or um, academic terms to express the Dharma. I think this is something I'm impressed with. But I didn't come across Ajahn Shah um, by Ajahn Shah himself initially. I, I started to be interested in Ajahn Shah firstly through my contacts with the Western monks in the UK. That's my start. Okay, thank you very much. Miss, we, uh, we are very thankful for Shah's introduction to the life of Ajahn Chah. We also thanks, uh, thank you so very much for your inquisitive presentation on the spread of Ajahn Chah, Time for Us Meditation in which it is mentioned that some monastery adapted in new context while maintaining their original route. Western monastery linked to Asia is in, is in the interest of both Asians and European Buddhists. How the Thai forest tradition took it was present in the paper is informative and give us much thought. So we deeply appreciate your presentation. Now, I would like to call on you to be present down the stage in front of the hall to receive the first certificate of appreciation and present. Allow me now to invite Wu Aung Kai Sui Jia Band to come to the front and present the certificate. Sui Jaban family has long been devotees of Venerable Professor Dr. Kamai Tamasami, the founder of SSPU. Thank you. Now is the time for closing remark. So I would like to welcome Venerable Dr. 
Bandawa Vivla from SSVU to deliver it. Benoît Wieser.